Happy New Year. I hope your 2020 is starting off with a bang. Thank you for listening to Author Stories through 2019 and all of the previous years. We had an amazing year last year and looking forward to doing bigger and better things this year. Before we get into the interview, we're going to thank a couple of sponsors who make the show possible. Please uh, give them a shout out and uh, look them up on Amazon and make sure that uh, you tell them that you appreciate their sponsorship of Author Stories. At the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. This audio clip is narrated by the one and only Luke Daniels. You're going to love this series. I love it so much. And uh, Richard has been a great supporter and sponsor of the show. And we're going to show him some love. Listen to the audiobook excerpt. You're going to love it. And uh, be sure to go to audible.com to purchase it. If you're not an Audible subscriber, you can get a free book just by signing up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash Hank. You get a 30-day free trial. You get the free book. If you decide to cancel your Audible subscription, you get to keep the free book. And it doesn't cost you a single penny. Audibletrial.com slash Hank. And uh, listen after the show for the clip from Richard Fox. We're so happy to have our friend Crystal Pico Watanabe as a sponsor of the show. Crystal is one of the best editors in the business. And she has just debuted a new service that I think you'll absolutely love. And will help you to up your writing game. Pico School of Wordcraft and Editing has just debuted and the first course is called Properly Punctuating Dialogue. It's a mini course and can be completed in just about 20 minutes. It covers the basics of dialogue punctuation. Authors can get access to the new school and the course for free by signing up for Crystal's author newsletter, Notes from Pico. Go to picoshouse.com slash newsletters. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com slash newsletters more in-depth courses will be added in 2020 make sure you don't miss a thing picoshouse.com slash newsletters unwilling souls by gregory d little books one and two are only 99 cents for a limited time the gods are rightfully imprisoned and Cess intends to keep them that way but her terrorist father has other plans Gregory D. Little's Unwilling Souls is a pulse-pounding chase through an epic fantasy world of adventure, sinister conspiracy, and a magical industrial revolution fueled by harvested human souls. Cess is the daughter of powerful parents who would very much like to kill one another and who therefore pretend she doesn't exist. An apprentice jailer of the gods, Cess spends her days learning to forge the tools needed to maintain the gods' prison. When her terrorist father attacks the prison on her 16th birthday, Cess is forced to flee after the secret of her parentage is revealed. Suddenly on the wrong side of the law, Cess realizes the very father who abandoned her may be the only one who can protect her. But some secrets are darker than parentage. On her way to find her father, Cess will uncover truths about her family and herself that will shatter her understanding of the world and risk the return of the gods themselves. Unwilling Souls and its sequel, Ungrateful God, are on sale now for only 99 cents. The third book of the series is coming early next year, so now is the perfect time to get up to speed. Unwilling Souls by Gregory D. Little. Books 1 and 2, only 99 cents for a limited time. Writers, I have an amazing tool to tell you about. A revolutionary writing tool for planning stories, Campfire Pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed. Complete your character design, create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC. Without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today. Visit CampfireTechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have my friend Lynn Constantine back on the show. She was here earlier this year uh, as with, with her sister, who uh, together they are the writing team known as Liv Constantine. Uh, but Lynn has a brand new book out. Uh, and she's writing under the name L.C. Shaw. The book is called The Network 
And this is an incredible read. If you guys are looking for a thriller to start your new year off, uh, this is one to grab. I promise you want this on your bookshelf. But welcome back to the show, Lynn. Thank you so much, Hank. It's great to be here. I am super excited to have you. Um, Lynn, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? My first memory would have to go back as a reader to my love of the Nan- of Nancy Drew books and stories and more of an oral storytelling, I guess, history. Ever, I just think back to when I would play with you know friends and we would always make stories up and and take our you know our Barbies or our dolls or whatever we happen to be playing with at the time. And there was always some kind of mystery and scandal associated with it for as long as I can remember. So I think it just kind of naturally evolved from that. I love it. The, those books were, uh, you know, gateway drugs for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. um, so many Absolutely. writers, you know, have have uh, named Nancy Drew as as a huge influence. Um, it, it, it's really interesting because um, you had an article published today in Crime Reads. Why we can't stop reading conspiracy fiction, and you know, for a lot of us, uh, the seeds of that were planted in those early books that we read, like Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys, and right. and some of those. This is something that uh, I, I was so glad when I saw that you published that today because, um, you know, this is this is something that that has been a, a love of mine my whole life, and it sounds so weird to even you know talk like that, but I, I love this kind of uh, you know twisted. Fiction. <laughs> what, what, what do you think it is that? Uh, and of course, I'm going to link up the article where people can go read it. But you know, kind of at the core, why do we love these kinds of stories? I think we're all a little disturbed, maybe, and that could be. You know, I, I think. I think because you know there is so much chaos in the in the world, and, and you know we which we try to make sense out of it. I think in some ways through story. And, you know, I don't, I think it's the same reason that crime shows continue to be you know, so popular and, and on, on television and, you know, and movies. And it's getting a look at that baser side of human nature that we want to understand. You know, we, we know that bad things happen. We know that there's, you know, people are motivated by corruption or different, you know, different things that are not uh, virtues, obviously. And I think when we delve into books like this, we get a firsthand look, especially you know, in their point of view, we get to see what makes them tick. Why are they like that? And it's, it's a fascinating journey, I think. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We, we had the, the TV on yesterday when we're recording this, this is um, uh, December the 19th. And yesterday uh, we had a, a vote in Congress to, you know, impeach our president. And this is not a discussion about, you know, who's on what side or whatever. But after reading your book, The Network, um, you know, when you're watching politics play out in real time and you see news stations covering this and, and if you flip back and forth between, you know, two or three different news outlets you see everyone has their own opinion and different spin on it Mm -hmm. and it's so easy to sit there and think about you know what's really going on behind the closed doors and the committees and and all of this and um you know your book didn't help yesterday i'm just gonna say that (laughs) it did or didn't it made you more paranoid it did it did but in a good way you know and i i I sat there thinking oh i'm gonna tell lynn about this tomorrow um so it was you know so much fun um, you, uh, we, we've talked previously, you know, about the, the work that you do with Valerie and as Liv Constantine, and you guys have, you know, put out two dynamite books and I know that you've got another one coming, uh, in the next few months. Um, my daughter, we went on a family trip, the this summer and, uh, I, I had both of your, your Liv Constantine books, uh, from Audible and I traded with with my middle daughter and I listened to one and she listened to the other and I'd already read the books, but, um, she, I, I, I got to listen to them, which is a completely different experience. And, um, she, she struggles with dyslexia. Um, like I did when I well, like I still do, but, um, you know, you learn to work around things. Um, but she, those books just absolutely captivated her and, you know, really reinvigorated her love, uh, of reading. Uh, how did you and um, uh, and Valerie come to do this thing together? 
had to write together. Yeah, to write um, together. Right. Well, a long time ago, probably, I don't know, over 20 years ago, we were talking about what we like, you know, what we like to read. And we were reading at the time a lot of women's fiction and more ethnic stories. And we were, Greek, were of Greek heritage. And we said to each other, you know, there really aren't any stories about Greeks out there. And knowing that both of us, uh, all of us are four, four children, and none of us married Greek um, spouses <laughs> and uh, wonderful people, all of them, you know, just so much to your mother's consternation. No, she really was fine. I mean, even my grandmother was, you know, who was from Greece was, was fine with it. I mean, that, you know, fortunately, they cared more about character than, than whether they were Greek or not. But the thing that we that my sister and I talked about was that when we were growing up, we had our grandmother there telling us stories, you know, speaking in her broken Greek with her accent, making foods from there. And by the time our children or my children came along, her children knew them. She was she was gone. And we felt like we were they really were not going to have any of those same experiences. So we wanted to write a book. It was a, a fiction book that's called Circle Dance that really um, captured what it was like growing up as a, as a Greek American. So that was our first book. So it wasn't necessarily that we said, oh, we should start writing together, but we both had a common desire to write this book together for our family. And, and so we did that. And then I moved to Connecticut. I was in Maryland at the time. And so we, we really didn't do any more writing together for a long time. And, she, you know, we both kind of went on. She got involved in her work. I was raising my kids. I was homeschooling them for six years. And then when I decided that when they went back to school and I was ready to kind of get back into working myself, I began writing this book, actually. Um, this book is the network has been in the works probably for over 20 years. And I so I finished that. And then Valerie said, you know, I think I'd like to collaborate again. So we began writing together again. Um, so it's been, you know, like I said, started a long time ago with a big hiatus in between. And then once we started again, we, we really enjoyed it and we just kept going. I, I didn't know that this book um, came first you in, in, in the writing. Um, one thing that I was uh, – um, surprised a little bit um but when i first started reading the network is uh that it's so different in tone from mm -hmm. the books that you write uh with valerie as as live um those are uh you know there's a very specific uh kind of feel to the live constantine mm -hmm. books and they're very um I've, I've been searching for a word for this they're, they're kind of very <laughs> close um very um you're very close to the characters. It's definitely more psychological. And uh, yeah. where, whereas, you know, when you write as Elsie Shaw in, in the, the network, it it's more of a uh, broad view, uh, more of a uh, lots of pieces on the chessboard. Um, I, I just don't have a good description for this, but there's I, I think you you know what I'm what I mean as yeah, Liv Constantine. It's more complicated. It's, yeah, it's it's more it, it's very close and you're you're getting very inside the character's head and um and and this is more like a like a, a traditional thriller. Um and I love both and I was I was sitting there trying to think of I, I wonder which one of these I like the best and I just can't put my hand on it. Um but <laughs> you said you you've been working on the network for a while. Where did the idea for this story come from? I, well, I used to work in marketing, uh, when, in corporate marketing for a long time. I ran a, depart, a marketing department for credit card companies. And, you know, so I spent my days coming up with devising campaigns aimed at changing behavior. And on, I started thinking one day just on the commute about how susceptible all of us are to the you know, advertising, to the media, to um, television and advertising. And I, I you know, in ways I think that we're not even aware just because we're so inundated all the time with messages from all of these different things. And, and this was, I mean, I think it's just gotten a million times worse today than it even was when I started writing the book. And so it, the idea just came to me of what if, what if this was deliberate? What if there was an orchestrated effort of a group or an individual p pulling all these, what look like separate pieces, but really, you know, at the, at their core, were working in concert to drive an agenda. And that's how the idea came. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very much at its core, you know, good versus evil, but it's also, I was also thinking like how easily 
people are distracted. All of us are distracted. And, you know, maybe we really have a, a, a better and a higher purpose to do something, but because we get so inundated and drawn into all these other things, we, you know, it's easy to distract people from kind of doing the right thing. And so that it just took off from there. And then as I got to know the characters, they took over initially Taylor was more of the main character and, and there's still Jack, Jack and Taylor are pretty equal, but I really, he wasn't my point of view character initially, but then he kind of took over the story. So and so, you know, I, I do try to follow the characters and let them develop. And it's gone through quite a few changes from the inception to, to publication. But, um, and, and it's, it's just, I, you know, I think everybody, every author sort of has that one book that's their heart book. And, and that is this for me. I, I really love this book. And it's, it's a, a book that I just had to write, but it just, like I said, it took a really long time <laughs> by the time it came out. So. <laughs> <laughs> with the um, the Live Constantine books, you write with Valerie, and uh, that that's a, a whole you know different creative process when you're working with someone else. But when you're working yeah. on a book like The Network, with so many twists and turns, um, and so many reveals that then take the story in a completely different direction, um, what's your creative process like when the you know from the beginning of an idea, um, you know, do you uh, do you outline out the story and, and get all the twists and turns worked out ahead of time or does it kind of come organically in the writing? It's a little bit of both. So, if, so with the live books, we don't, we hardly outline at all. Um, and with this one, I don't have a strict outline, but I definitely have a, um, a game plan and an idea of where it's going. And so it's a, it's a loose outline, which changes a lot. And then some of the twists I know, but then typically I go through a lot of times, you know, and also in, in the editorial process with my editor. And so then I'll, and I'll say, okay, what else, you know, we need more twists or, or something else has to happen. How could I turn this around? And so for the network, I'm trying to think, I mean, it's been edited, gosh, like, you know, <laughs> eight or nine rounds, or I can't even, I can't even keep track at this point, but I, I did have to, be a be a little bit more deliberate in the planning of it because it is so complicated. I mean, you know that was that was that was the challenge, and I had to make sure that that all the threads you know made sense and I'd go back and look at it. So there was a lot of back and forth and a lot of editing. And then the same thing in the second book, some actually some things changed. I wrote it and I thought, you know what, this it doesn't have enough action. What can I do? And then all of a sudden, you know, a character came back that I wasn't expecting to come back. Another character that I thought was going to live ended up having to die. You know, just, I just have to go where, where the story takes me. So. The, so, so let's give people the, the setup for the book. Um, so we begin um, with Jack Logan and he gets uh, a visit. Um, tell us kind of how the book opens and what you use to, to, to grab us with the tension right off. Sure. So you start off with Jack, and he is thinking about a story. He's, a, he's an investigative journalist, and he's thinking about this meeting he just had with a woman whose, whose daughter died because there's a, a television show called Teenage Wasted that, um, this, that the network is pushing where kids are um, using erotic asphyxiation and they're ending up dead because, you know, it, it goes too far. And then other kids are imitating it. And, he's, and so there's a big Supreme Court case. They're trying to get the show off the air, but it's freedom of speech. So he's thinking of all about that when um, all of a sudden there's a knock at his door and this senator who he knows what, comes in telling him he's, that, he's, that the senator is about to be murdered and asking Jack to go and help the senator's wife, Taylor, who used to be Jack's love, who uh, lost, you know, lost love, the only woman that he's really ever loved. But, there, but she's not speaking to him because of a betrayal. So he thinks that, you know, the guy must be crazy. He leaves, you know, he, the senator runs out, leaving him like a remote and a letter. And then a week later, he hears on the news that the senator died while scuba diving in Micronesia of a, an allergy attack. And he knows that it was made to look like an accident. So he, he's off and running. And then the story takes off from there. The, there are some, some really heavy um, issues uh, kind of at, at the heart of the story. And, and in the very beginning, we see that there's this issue of freedom of speech versus 
um, you know, what's, what's good for the rest of us. And, uh, right. that is, that is a really precarious line to walk. Um, because, you know, once you start censoring things, where do you stop it? Uh, but right. what also is the responsibility of a big media company? Um, to set a good example, maybe set a good example is not a good, um, uh, but to, to at least be a responsible corporate right. citizen. Um, you know, when, when you're wrestling with that as a writer and, and writers, you know, uh, uh, are kind of front and center with uh, the freedom of speech issues, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how, how do you wrestle with that in the writing of a story like this? I try to make it, I try to really remove myself and anything that I might think from it and really do it from the character's perspective, because I think, you know, there just are so many, like you said, there's, 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 it's a slippery slope for so many issues. And you do, you, you can't really necessarily draw a hard line and say, well, here's, here's what, you, you know, what you can and what you can't say, because again, who, who is the arbiter of that and who knows what is the right thing? I mean, you would hope that public opinion would be enough, you know, in the instance of this, like this company where people would be outraged. Um, but then you're always going to have other people who just say, well, you know, everybody has to make their own decision. And there are other issues that, you know, I try to tackle in the book. Like there's the quite, there's a lot of bioethic bioethicist type of things and issues such as euthanasia. Um, you know, what, what is the responsibility um, of the medical community? I mean, do we let people suffer or, do we, you know, put them out of their suffering? But on the other hand, if if you go too far with that, are they going to start mandating? Well, if somebody has a disease that's too far gone, they're not going to treat them. So, you know, I think any issue can go on either side. So I have characters who feel both ways in the book about that. And that, I mean, I try to really present um, just exactly what they would do. You know what I mean? I'm, I don't want this to be something I'm not trying to preach to anybody through the book, but just really be authentic to the characters and ho hopefully I've achieved that. Uh, absolutely. Um, as we go through this book and more of the story unfolds and unwinds, um, you know, we, we start seeing the, the powers behind the powers and the, uh, the things that are really driving uh, a lot of the things in the book. When, when you start dealing with, uh, you know, backroom deals, secret societies, things like that, um, is there any sort of research you can do for for things like that? You you really draw it so authentically, um, or, or is this just complete you know figment of your imagination? It's a fig. I mean, yeah. I don't. I, I would it be great if I could get into some of those backgrounds, <laughs> you know, what's going on? But nobody wanted to let me in there. Right. Um, so yeah. Um, I mean, there, you know, there was obviously research into the book for different components, but other things, but for the, for the dealing and like the senators in there, yeah, I just kind of, I mean, you know, I'm sure it's a collective uh, consciousness of, of just what we see all the time, right. In, in television and, and media, but I just tried to imagine, um, you know, what everyone's agenda is and then how that would go. Like, I mean, I think we all know how the, the whole business of lobbying, you know, people are paid to, to push what they want to push. And it's not necessarily because it's something that they believe in, but, but that's, you know, what they're trying to do and senators and all of it. I mean, I think we, we just can turn the news on and we can see that it's right there. Right. Unfortunately. Yeah. As you wrote this book, did the characters of Jack and Taylor uh, surprise you uh, in, in telling their story? Yes. Yeah, they did. Um, especially um, Taylor, because she, you know, she, she changed a lot through, through editing and through the course of the book. And she, she ended up becoming a much stronger character than I had originally uh, anticipated, which I was, which I was glad to see. And she, um, you know, she takes charge. She's been through and she does go through quite a bit in, in both this book and the, and the second one that I just finished writing. But um, she surprised me with her resilience and um, in, a, in a good way. Having um, their relationship, their their former relationship, uh, as you know, kind of the the centerpiece of what holds them together, um, was a really interesting choice. Uh, I thought uh, because you you get um, 
some built in tension there and, you know, the, the idea of trust issues, uh, kind of right off the bat. Um, was that something that you had planned for them from the beginning and, and, uh, how do you think that affects their characters going forward? Yes, I did. I mean, I liked the, the aspect of the relationship that they, they were lived next door to each other and that they were childhood friends before they became romantically involved. And, you know, I feel because their history is so, intertwined with each other and it's so much more than just even a a high school or a college romance because they were they're almost family in a way you know um, the boy boy next door or girl next door and they know everything about each other so I I wanted it to be something really that would deeply affect um, both of them and especially Taylor when she had trusted him you know with every secret that she ever had and felt that he was the person she could count on more than anything in the world. And then when you know, she's betrayed by him, that's something that really shaped her, her character going forward. Um, and her, and her really influenced her ability to trust her, even her own instincts for a long time after that. So, um, you know, I, it just, it, it kind of, it occurred naturally, but I mean, I, I definitely knew I wanted to have that tension, but I think the fact that, um, like I said, that they had, it was more than just a romance, that they had this really strong friendship from the time they were children made it uh, even more complicated. Another interesting aspect of this book and uh, kind of story uh, is the idea of uh, faith and belief and uh, you know, faith in uh, in God or, or a higher power, uh, and also, you know, our, our faith in humanity and, and one another. Um, could you talk a little bit about that story thread and, and what drove that for you? Sure. Um, so I, I tried to demonstrate that one through my, you know, the, the, the parallel story that's going on in the book that goes back to the 1970s. And we're in a very close first person uh, point of view with her and hearing all of her thoughts. And she is this me- young medical student who is um, an atheist. She was Greek Orthodox and she's ter- kind of turned away and put all of her faith into medicine and into her intellect. And she, and her, and she's very proud and her pride is actually kind of part of her downfall. So she is recruited to the Institute, which is this facility shrouded in secrecy for what she believes to be a medical internship. And she's very quickly um, realizes she's made a, an error in going there and she's taken hostage. And so her story, you travel with her as she's learning about the Institute, why she's there, what the um, antagonist has in store for her. And she, and so her journey from atheist to com- coming back to a faith in God is born out of, I guess, of her, desperation and of her having to really look at why she lost her faith, which really was, well, I won't give too much away, but, you know, wasn't any major thing. It was just, again, sort of distracted and in a gradual you know, erosion, involved, in a gradual erosion, just, yeah, not paying attention or whatever. Um, so, and then you have Jack who the very first line of the book is that he ditched his Catholic upbringing right, for right. Kids of guilt, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, <laughs> He is the character who is very uh, suspicious and skeptical of religion and has seen, you know, because let's face it, in every endeavor, whether religion, I mean, there's good and there's bad people are, you know, we're all, we're all, we all have the capacity for both in us. So it's, it's very easy, I think, to, to look at where any institution falls down. And if you want to focus on that, which is what he does, you know, and he, he's got some bitterness just from family issues and, different things with the church. So he, I intentionally kept Jack neutral to it because, you know, I didn't, again, I'm not trying to say that, you know, you have to be a person of faith to be good, or if you don't have faith, you're bad. That's really not what it's about. It's about each character's individual story. And, you know, it does so happen that the antagonist is evil, but I mean, they usually are. So I didn't really see, (laughs) you know, a way around that, but you know, I, I wanted to keep Jack the one person in the book who the jury's out for him. You know, he doesn't know. And he's, he looks at things from a completely different lens than the characters in the book who are looking at things through faith. And he's the kind of the one, the voice of reason who's like, all right, like, you know, let's come back to reality. Let's, 
look at what's going on. So, and I think it's important because I, and I've seen that, you know, if you comment sometimes on, on reviews or whatever, thinking that I'm saying, no, all the good people are Christians and the bad are not. And that, and it's really not because Jack is the main character and he's not a Christian. He's just, he's sort of an agnostic. So. And the, uh, the lesson there is never read reviews. <laughs> I know. My agent <laughs> keeps telling me that. <laughs> I know. Oh man, um, the network you 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 know have told us about the the long history of this book, um, seeing it finally um, come together and come out in print uh, has to be an amazing feeling. Um, but you've mentioned a couple of times the follow up to this book. This is this is actually the launch of a new series, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. Yes. And uh, yeah, we don't necessarily know what the series name is going to be at this point, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely a, at least a part two, hopefully there'll be more. Um, and I've finished the, um, well, I'm almost finished, you know how that goes. I'm, I'm one half way through edits and I'll probably get one more round from my editor, um, but the story is finished. And uh, yeah, I'm the only person other than my editor and agent that have read it is my husband. And he's, he tells me it's as, he likes it as much. So hopefully uh, it holds up. Yeah. What was the, so. what was the writing process like for that second book? Um, you know, because this one has such a, a long history with you and, you know, mm -hmm. rounds and rounds of edits and the book changes as time goes on. Uh, but then when you're writing a follow up to that, you, we're talking about a compressed window of time. Uh, I'm sure what was, what was it like yeah. writing a follow up <laughs> to that when, when this first book had been with you for so long? It was really hard. I mean, it was, the, I, I, it was, I, I wrote it because again, with timing now doing two books a year. So I actually wrote the first draft in two months. I mean, I, it was a breakneck speed and I, I gave myself my writing goals and I would not let myself get out of my chair until I wrote those words every day. And so the, the first draft, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really sure how it was going to be, but my, I, my editor, you know, liked it. And said, you know, I think that you've got good bones here. But then I, I went through and I changed. I did probably four or five more rounds over the course of the next, I guess, six months or so. But it was it was really difficult because the network is very fast paced. You know, it's the short chapters that are on the run. So there's a ton of right. action and, and suspense. And so for book two, I, they're not on the run. But I mean, there's obviously a lot going on. Um, but it, it, it wasn't it didn't have that same you know, out of breath, oh my gosh, like looking over your shoulder all the time. So I had to make sure that I infused it with other things to make it exciting and action-packed. And that's where some of that, what I was saying earlier, where I thought I was going one way and then all of a sudden I realized, no, I need to, I need to put more into it. So I do believe now it has the same um, sort of hopefully page turning effect as the first one, but I, it was, it was a lot for me to try to you know, follow it up with. And it, it's it's kind of like that sophomore book I think we've talked about. So this is the sophomore book for Elsie Shaw. And that book is just always so hard, especially if you feel like you've done your job with the first one and you don't want to let readers down, right? And have them say, oh, you know, this is not as good as number one. So there's, all, <laughs> there's that pressure that, you know, you have as well. Um, so I'm happy it's finished. And hopefully, you know, it will, hopefully it will be, well received, so, but I won't know because I won't read the reviews. So. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see where you take the series. Um, the network uh, is out everywhere now uh, by Elsie Shaw. We uh, we know her as Lynn Constantine. Um, we're going to put a link to it in the show notes, Lynn. Um, if folks are just learning about you and want to dig into all of the crazy stuff that you do, where can they find you online and connect with you? I'm so lcshawauthor.com is my website and I'm also on Twitter and Instagram uh, lcshawauthor and I love to hear from readers and you know interact with them especially on Instagram there's a lot going on there absolutely absolutely Lynn yeah. thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today ah uh, thank you thanks for having me it's always great talking to you stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's the Ember War. The near future. Humanity's only hope of survival entered the solar system at nearly the speed of light. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, 
The probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back, 
and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? He murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right. Dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. How? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? He asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen, the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to his ear, Mark stopped and looked around before deciding how to continue. Spiked ocotillo plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? he asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast. Punk, decayed wood, used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.